Hi, everyone. And now we welcome uh, Steve Hayes with us. And I have to say, Steve has a tremendous experience in software development and especially in agile development. I think when he was involved in helping uh, teams, companies or developers uh, have a better life, let's say, because that's what we're trying to do. Uh, yeah, I was still playing uh, video games and that was my whole connection with IT. So then we have a lot to learn from Steve. Um, hello, Steve. Are you with us? Yes, hello. Hello. A right. pleasure to have you at CodeCamp, the online gathering this time. And of course, we're hoping that at some time soon, uh, we can uh, host you here in Romania, in Yash, or Cluj, or Bucharest, or Timisoara, or other city. How that are you? Be lovely. So, or, Steve, I've got one question. So. Are you suggesting that software engineers Software developers are not perfect human. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> sure, of course, of course they are. Like all human beings, every human being is perfect in their own special way, right? <laughs> okay. So, is there more than one thing that you would like to change to software <laughs> engineers, <laughs> or or is that it's just one and you want to share it with us today so there's lots of things that i would like to change if i could suddenly educate and uh and enable everyone but i'm just going to pick on one today because okay. i, cause I think the thing that i think is most important might might surprise people okay. to be honest i'm very curious to find out what that is so then without further ado you have the floor okay and so let me let me sort out let's see this oops share the screen Desktop. Yeah, and see. go. Oops, hang on. I'm just in. You're in the way. I just have to slide you aside. Okay, is that working now? Yes. All right. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about the one thing that I would change if I could only change one thing. My life. And I was interesting listening to the end of the last presentation since I used to identify as a coach. Uh, I've spent a lot of my time coaching teams or working with teams and being a leader of teams. Uh, and as, as I was saying, there's lots of things I would like to change, but let's, let's pick on just one today. Um, I have lots of what I'll call personal bugbears, things that annoy me. Um, I have been a, a student of personal performance, personal improvement and excellence. Once upon a time, if you had asked, where does excellent performance come from? Is it born? Is it a gift of nature? Or is it something you grow? Is it personal development? The jury would have been out. But there's lots of research about where excellence comes from these days. And within certain boundaries, it's mostly about growing as an individual, having a growth mindset and, and having what Malcolm Gladwell popularized as um, the discipline development. <clears throat> so there's lots of opportunities for us to get better. And I would like to, to improve the quality of our code. I'm originally a programmer. I started my programming career back in 1985. Uh, and I think we could all be better programmers. I think we could also just make our code better as a communication tool, which is what it is primarily to me. A code is about talking to the computer, but that's easy. Code is mostly about talking to other human beings. And I, I think we could make that better. I also think that especially in the last few years, we have had a tendency to focus on programming. We, we've tried to grow the number of programmers and, it, and it, it's pro development is a technical challenge. There's no doubt in my mind. And the, the difficulties and the complexity of the environments we deal with keep growing so there's no argument at all that we need to program but we also need to focus on building solutions not just coding and and being more engaged with the business which brings me to the last point that we we teach a lot of programming and software development but we don't teach much about business and if you're going to work in a commercial environment which most of us do then you need to accept that there are commercial constraints. Um, 
and that the programming in a commercial environment is different to programming in a in an academic environment or just at home right D different games in each sense so that's stuff that i would like to improve as an individual and then <coughs> nicole and jez and kim have published a book called accelerate which which i think is a marvelous book and it's a whole bunch of things you can do practically that are based on research right one of the, the challenges in our industry is that most of our the things we do including agile are based primarily on anecdote and personal preference and personal experience we, we don't have that much which is backed up by research so it's great that they have published research and conclusions and they've got 24 different things that you could look at as possibilities for improvement, some of which look fairly straightforward. I would hope that everybody is using version control, but on the other hand, I'm sometimes surprised by the people who aren't. Okay. So given my biases and, and this list, there's plenty of things that we could improve on a technical basis. And then there's emotions. Coding is a very emotional business. We're humans. And we, we're working in an industry that, that still hasn't figured out what good looks like or what professionalism means in our context. This is a challenging environment. And you've probably come up against these kinds of problems if you're working in teams. Like you've suddenly, someone in the team or the organization is resisting some technology choice. And it's not clear why they're doing it. Why? Don't they want to go along? Everybody else has been convinced, but there's one person holding out. Or someone keeps finding reasons not to write code. They need to do some research or they need to go and talk or they need to prepare a presentation. And or they're, they're continually finding the tasks in the team that don't require them to write code. And that seems confusing. Or, or you're dealing with business people who are pushing for some commitment to a deadline that seems completely arbitrary. Or you've got teammates that just don't get along and that's impacting everybody. Or, and this one I see all the time, your current team is saying that their work is hard because the existing code was rubbish and the previous developers were idiots. None of these are technical problems. They're emotional problems. Okay, so we've got all sorts of stuff that we can improve to be better software developers. So what's my one thing? I, I like to give this to an as an exercise to people when I'm working uh, on coaching. Like, what would you change if you had a magic wand? If you could wave your magic wand and just change one thing, what would it be? <clears throat> and the winner for me is that I would give everyone I work with more empathy and more compassion. Uh, I, I'd love technical things to get better, but I think that this is more important. So let me explain what I mean by empathy and compassion, just so that we're all on the same page and, uh, and why I would do this. And then we'll talk about what would change. Okay. So why, why would I change that? Because we're not building technical systems. We're building what Jess Kerr has called socio-technical systems. Okay. We, and socio-technical means taking an approach that recognizes that there is both social and technical things going on at the same time. We are building technical things, but we're also building the system that will change the technical things. And that system has people in it. And in some cases, the system we're building has much broader impact and in fact changes some aspect of society itself with Facebook currently being the poster child. I mean, you don't, the developers at Facebook are not just building a piece of software. They're building a system for keeping Facebook running and they're changing the world through the impact of their system. And you need to really consider that larger system when you're starting to focus on what do you want to change. Uh, and I wrote this deck back in February, being prepared for an earlier version of the, the, the conference before the world changed a little bit. Uh, and then in just in August, Kent Beck, the, the, uh, the father of extreme programming, wrote this column, which I recommend to you. 
And he wrote in that, if every programmer woke up, the question in the interview was, if every programmer woke up tomorrow with a new habit, what would you want it to be? And he said, compassion, it's a learnable skill. I, Kent, don't have it naturally. I had to learn it and I exercise it most of the time now. And the follow-up question was, is compassion wanting among programmers or just among everybody? And he said, certainly societally, we have a huge deficit of compassion. I think programmers stereotypically can have poor social skills. I think it's even harder to have compassion without a brain wired that way. I, Kent, just don't read social situations well, period. Just the same as I'm red, green, colorblind. But unlike colorblindness, I can practice compassion and get better at it. So it was somewhat reassuring that someone I know of as a deep thinker agreed with me, although it also felt like I, now I look like I'm following Kent rather than I had an opportunity to lead, but I missed it. So what are empathy and compassion? Empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another person. Compassion builds on empathy. Compassion is the sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings and misfortunes of others. So one is recognizing that other people have feelings and understanding what those feelings are. And the second one is being sympathetic to the fact that they do. So let's do a little bit of background. We're not born with those skills, okay? Uh, childhood development is a whole body of knowledge. And we know that children roughly learn to read emotions at the age of about three or four. Like they can start to recognize in, in faces what people are thinking. Not everybody can do that. There are some people who never learn to do that because of the brain, way their brains are wired. But fundamentally, most of us take time. And before that age, before we start to develop empathy and compassion, we're very self-centered as individuals and a, and a little bit sociopathic, but hopefully most of us grow out of that. And there's... On top of just those fundamental skills that you develop as you age, <clears throat> there's also a common pattern across all people in the way we respond to pr problem situations. And it's called fundamental attribution error. And I have sometimes summarized this as, I do bad things because of the situation in which I'm placed. You do bad things because you're an idiot. Yeah. Uh, and it's an inescapable human thing. And a very good example is when you're in traffic, if you're driving around and you find that uh, someone cuts you off. When someone else cuts you off, you very quickly assign blame that it's because they're careless or they're selfish, they're jerks, that there's something inherently negative about the, the person themselves. When you cut someone off, as we all do, I have certainly done it myself, it's because, oops, I'm sorry, I just didn't see you, or I wasn't paying attention, or I'm in a hurry. Like, it's not me, the person that I assign blame to, it's the context, yeah? And, and every human being does this. And someone once asked me, um, does this change when you know somebody really, really, really well? And I have been married to my wife 21 years now, and I still do this. When something goes wrong, I still leap to fundamental attribution error. I still go, well, that's because you're, and then I recover fairly quickly. But, but even after all that time, it's still a natu an impulse, a human impulse. <clears throat> so we can, and I'm a fairly empathetic and compassionate kind of person, but I still do this as well. And the, the other thing that is layered on top of this again, by societal organization, just the way we seem to think as a, as a group, the way the world should work, is the idea of rational decision making in business. This idea that at business, we should leave our feelings at the door. Yeah. Um, and we should pursue shareholder value maximization in an organization. But, but uh, organizations fundamentally exist to make money yeah. and that their customers are rational decision-making human beings. 
not uh, not real human beings that they've been abstracted away and become computers that make economic decisions and it's summed up in the, the line from the godfather where it's nothing per it's not personal sunny it's strictly business so we start as growing human beings with with no empathy and compassion we develop that as we go but we still fall into the trap of uh, fundamental attribution error and then we have a society that says business is not really about emotions it's about rational decisions now the rational decision making is just a model it's a simplified approach that lets us think more easily about situations that we're in and there's nothing wrong with having models of how things work um, but all models are approximations which means all models are wrong, but some are useful. And there are certainly contexts in which rational decision-making and everything that goes with it are useful, but it's just a model and it's not always useful. And I think we're well past the point where this idea that people are rational decision-makers is useful to us. It holds us back from effective engagement with coworkers, with customers, and with society as a whole right it's useful as an input but not it's not complete enough and economics as a study field of study was a long time fascinated by rational models of decision making but they've moved on as well and now there's a thing called behavioral economics a well-established discipline that builds on top of rational modeling and talks about how people really behave in the world not how we think they should behave if they're just making economic decisions. And I think as software developers, we need to do something similar. We need to stop talking only about the technical aspects of things or pretending that what we do is about rational decision-making and ex embrace the idea that there are humans involved. Now, what happens if we start to embrace compassion well, I'm not advocating for it because I think it's inherently a good thing. I do think it's a good thing, but I'm advocating for it because I think it gives us better results and it helps us feel better about our work and that that is a virtuous cycle. That feeling better about our work helps us produce better results, which helps us feel better about our work and so on and so forth. <coughs> so, what would we see, what would happen if we all started to be a bit more compassionate? Well, just as human beings, we would act as if everyone was like us with the same, with strengths, weaknesses, and, and insecurities, right? We know that we are like that. Yet when we start to think about other people, it's tempting to forget about that and just treat them as rational decision-making units. But no, everybody has, strengths and weaknesses and insecurity <clears throat> then we would appreciate that everyone has feelings about the work they're doing about the team they're working in maybe their feelings are even stronger than the feelings that we have and we would start to treat mental health across the board in the same way that we treat physical health uh, and i cannot speak for other disciplines but it's clear that in our discipline we have a significant number of people who have mental health problems not necessarily large ones like, like i'm not talking about schizophrenia or, uh, and ma major <clears throat> mental disorders but depression and anxiety are rife in our profession uh, we live in our heads and sometimes things go a little bit wrong so it would be great to understand that we're all human beings uh, and we would move to what I will call win-win modes of thinking. We wouldn't be looking at how do I make my argument the winner. We would look, be looking much more at what are the elements of my ideas that are good and how do we combine this with other people's ideas? How do we move forwards as a group where everyone benefits? Those are just human factors in being compassionate and empathetic. When we start to talk about it just within development teams, we can be a little bit more specific. We would assume positive intent. 
that every developer, past and present, is or was just like us. And that people in the past made the best decisions that they could, given the context they were in at the time. Right? Again, skipping past this problem of fundamental attribution error and blaming people, blame the context rather than blaming people. We would also appreciate that very few of the decisions that we make are neutral. There are often inadvertent winners and losers. Sometimes they're within the team. When, when we choose a technology, there are often people who prefer something else. They are inadvertent losers. And we, if we showed empathy and compassion for them, we would support them rather than doing something like, well, this is just the obvious decision, like just suck it up. Sometimes those losers are outside of our group. Every time we decide to prioritize features, however that's done, someone wins and sometimes someone loses. Uh, and again, we have this tendency to treat this as just a rational outcome that should be treated as, as just a neutral fact, but it's not. It's something that impacts humans we would try to create space for other people's needs. So uh, some people need to need quiet time. Some people need to think by themselves. So even I advocate for pair programming all the time, but sometimes you need to create spaces where people can work alone just for their, their own mental health and just for their needs. Okay. Not, we wouldn't necessarily say this is our single development process and everybody has to conform to it. We would think about how it impacted individual people. And, and we would see ourselves as a team as being co-dependent. Uh, this would have potentially broader impact even on compensation. If we decide that we win and lose as teams, not as individuals, then how do we fairly compensate people for different levels of contribution, just because they're different people. So all of those things would potentially change. <clears throat> As managers, we would start to acknowledge feelings in our decision-making. So when I, as a manager or a leader, tell some people what to do, yes, certainly I want them to do it, but I also would actively acknowledge the negative ramifications of that and the positives and deal with those up front. And if you do that sort of thing, then you start to in, uh, build environments where people feel safe to bring them, themselves to work, their whole selves. And part of that as a leader is demonstrating your own vul vulnerability, not trying to look like you are perfect and always make the right decisions and justify everything you do as 100% accurate, but acknowledge that there is uncertainty and risk and winners and losers and, and look like a human being. We would also spend a lot more time sharing information as managers because some people, we, we often build environments where decisions are made at some point and people can't see the rationales or the reasoning behind the decisions, which makes it very, very difficult for them to, to understand and accept those things. But once you acknowledge that everyone on your team is a person, and you're showing them empathy and compassion, like they're not just cogs in a machine, then you really want to share lots more about what's going on. And as managers, we would also have to work quite hard to embrace diversity. And, and I've been a manager in lots of different situations, and I know that the easiest thing for me to manage uh, are teams where everyone is like, like me, not in the broad sense, but in the narrow sense of, you know, really, fundamentally, they're older white males who have deep backgrounds in software development who think the same way I do. That's the easiest thing for me to do as a manager, but it's not the best thing for the business. It's, and it's not the best thing for the, the software development organization. So you, you can actively step outside and not just use default processes for trying to embrace diversity, but encourage building up diversity on your teams. And as part of a business, software development teams would appreciate that there are lots of other people depending on us for their success. And that is demanding for them and they feel insecure 
right? They, they need us to get their jobs done or for them to be successful. And that dependence is uncomfortable for them and leads them to do things that perhaps don't seem to make sense to us. Okay. So we could really try to understand what's driving people outside of our teams and proactively consider the impact of our work on those people and provide information, just like I suggested managers would need to provide more information down, that we would proactively share information outwards because we would be showing compassion for their needs and understanding that their perspective is different to ours. So this is, this is hard work. It's not necessarily easy stuff. <laughs> what do we get in return for all the effort that we put in to building empathy and compassion? Well, the barriers between people start to erode. The barriers between the people on our team, the barriers between our teams and our business unit, mutual respect becomes much more common because we just understand everybody better and we demonstrate that we understand everybody better. And it's the demonstration part that is often missing. And we start, because we're doing all that, we can start to build solutions that are better aligned because people are being honest and transparent about what their needs actually are rather than trying to pretend in some way or live up to some model of what a business person should be like. And when decisions are made, we make it clear that we embrace everybody's opinions those decisions become higher quality and, and we don't have to defend them over and over. I've frequently been in situations where a decision has been made, but because not everyone was actually brought along on that decision, it, it continues to be attacked. This, it feels like you're fighting an ongoing guerrilla war uh, over a particular decision. But if you can act m with more of a sense of human uh, connection, then a lot of that stuff can be reduced. So that's, those are the benefits as I see them. So how do you do it? How do you actually start to act with more empathy and compassion for your fellow developers? Uh, I recommend this, I have recommended this book many, many times over my career, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And it's a book that I reread regularly myself. So I recommend that you read it. Uh, I'm generally not a fan of self-help books. I find them quite, I think of them as quackery, um, just often nonsense just to sell a book. But this I have found to be very, very useful. And one of the principles in uh, Seven Habits is seek first to understand and then to be understood. The idea is that if, if we are having a conversation or a disagreement in particular, the first thing I should do is listen to you until I can echo back to your, your argument, your position, what you're feeling, until I can echo all of that back to you and all you do is nod and say yes. But that doesn't mean that I have to agree with you. It just means that I can demonstrate that I understand you. Yeah. And once you've demonstrated to somebody else that you understand them, then they will give you a lot more space to explain yourself. Okay. So I think the very first step in this is to learn to be a good listener uh, and a, in a very active and specific kind of way. I think you also need to learn to ask yourself why a lot. Why are people doing what they're doing? Uh, it's very easy and I fall into this trap myself you know, human being, fundamental attribution error, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, why are people doing this? What the heck is going on? They don't make any sense. But if I can take a step back and try and explain things, like what, what could be going through their head that would make them behave that way? What would lead them to respond in that manner? Uh, and, and the first thing I have to do is speculate. I have to just guess, but then I can start to look for confirmation and I can start to ask questions about how they feel about things and try to understand their, their responses in that context and see if I'm right. And the first step, which is the most difficult one, 
is trying to understand why people might not be open to sharing their, their positions and what they're really thinking in the current environment. It can be very difficult to, to really describe your position at work because you feel that you're breaking one of those earlier assumptions, like you're breaking that business model of being rational, like you, sh you think you should leave your emotions at the door. So building an open environment is a challenge. And that's the first place you can start. Where, why is our environment not open right now? What do we do to people who express emotions? What do I do to people who express emotions? How do I respond? Yeah, am, I do, am I being fair? Am I encouraging them? Another thing is to just be sincerely curious. People can tell the difference between a question you ask to try to bolster your own argument or to undermine them and a question you ask out of sincere curiosity. So being sincerely curious and just wanting to understand is a great step. And finally, and from this perspective, be proactive articulate your needs, try to anticipate the unspoken needs of others, be considerate in yourself, lead by demonstrating the behaviors that you would like others to pick up. <clears throat> it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard because you need to be prepared for asymmetry that you're going to be exposing yourself and feeling vulnerable and trying to be considerate and no other people around you might not be. And that's going to feel uncomfortable and you may feel like people are taking advantage of you. So you definitely need to be prepared. It's very helpful to build a small group of people who, uh, who are willing to collaborate with you on trying to change the environment. If it's within your team, even if you can just find one other person to work with you, someone that where you can go down the pub if we can ever go down the pub again and have a beer and and say, wow, that was really tough. Yeah, that, that was really difficult. And, and just have somebody who this is there supporting you. So that's a, a very useful thing in any change, but certainly if you're trying to change to build empathy and compassion within your team or your organization and be prepared to be challenged and for it to be a challenging situation. People steeped in this unrational mindset can be uncomfortable with feelings. Uh, there are certainly, I've worked at organizations where it would have felt really, really uncomfortable to raise my own feelings and people would have pushed back and said, I don't think this is the appropriate environment for that kind of thing. But I simply don't think that that's true anymore but it is something you will probably encounter. So if you're able to make that transition, if you can start to build empathy and compassion, what happens to those situations that I described earlier? Well, when someone's resisting a technology choice for no apparent reason, maybe you can dig into that. Maybe it's because they had been hoping to specialize in a different tool maybe that's the reason and maybe there's a way to try to satisfy that need or and what can we do about that or at least you can acknowledge that there was an impact on them if you've got that teammate that keeps finding excuses not to write code why might that be well maybe it's because they're scared of revealing some kind of ignorance whether it's about the language or about the tool set that you've started picking up maybe they don't know spring boot and they're finding it really difficult to understand and if we can and they're trying to avoid it because they don't want to look stupid in which case if we acknowledge that if someone says hey i feel stupid every time we work on spring boot then there are ways around that and we can give them books or training or mentor specifically in that thing you know we can fix it if we know what the problem is <coughs> If those business people are pushing for some commitment that seems to be completely arbitrary, maybe it's not arbitrary. Maybe there's some regulatory deadline, or maybe there's, they're worried about losing a critical client and they just don't want to share that. Or you know, there are reasons. If we know the reasons, then we can probably come up with a different approach. Oh, you're worried about losing this critical client? Well, what do they really care about? What's the major thing? Maybe we can just deliver a small piece that will keep them happy. And we don't have to worry about delivering everything by that deadline. 
if you've got two teammates who simply can't get along, maybe you can figure it out that it's because they have different expectations of what's important. One person thinks that delivering something to production as early as possible, even if it's fairly crappy underneath, is important. And the other person thinks that uh, because we never go back and clean up code, it's really important that we actually d deliver it in, in a clean code, high quality state. And because they have these two different expectations, they're at loggerheads, but they've never shared those things. So it seems like they fight all the time. Or, or someone says their work is hard because the existing code is rubbish. Well, like I said before, maybe the previous developers were under a lot of delivery pressure and we can stop saying those things and just work with what we have, not with what we wish we had. All of these things require displaying some level of empathy and compassion for the people you're working with or for the people who came before you. Uh, the Dalai Lama also seems to think that compassion is quite important. Uh, the Dalai Lama said, if you want others to be happy, practice compassion. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. Right? But compassion is a critically important part of being a human being. Uh, and we shouldn't think that just because we're in a technical business environment, we can ignore that or should ignore that. So these are some of the uh, sources that I've pulled from for this presentation. Uh, I think that everybody should have a crack at those as well as Accelerate, which was on the slides earlier. I think that's a useful book though. It's not really about compassion and being human. Uh, Jessica Kerr, uh, that's a really great blog post from her that you will find on the internet uh, fundamentally about building socio-technical systems. Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, strongly recommended. And I can't pronounce Charles's surname, but The Power of Habit and how hard it is to change the habits that we have formed over time, uh, even when it's good for us. You know, changing habits is possibly one of the most difficult things that we try to do as human beings, but uh, it's a very important thing to be able to, to do. And that's the end. So I will stop sharing my screen and we will, uh, oh, there we go, pause the share. Oh. Stop the share. There we go. Great. Steve, a very profound uh, talk. So thank you personally for that. And uh, I, I... Yeah, I think you need more empathy. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> so it's been really, really great. And, and, and um, there are some questions, of course. Oh. So one is coming from out of curiosity. <laughs> Someone is curious. What other people answers were uh, when you ask uh, them the question or you, you ask them to do the exercise of what would you change? The one thing that you, you would change? Oh, your... so yeah, sorry. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's um, I, I actually haven't asked that question in this specific context. Um, I've asked that question in lots of other contexts, like, we're having a code, you know, people saying, oh, my code is, our code is rubbish. Okay, well, if you had a magic wand, what's the one thing you would change? I just find it a useful question in lots of different contexts because people hold themselves back from offering solutions because they think those solutions aren't practical or, or will be expensive or something like that. So <clears throat> if you're trying to get people to be a bit more open and, and brainstorm, it's good to try to find a way to pull away the constraints. And, and one way to do that is to say, don't worry about anything. If you had a magic wand, what would you change in this situation? But, but I'll, I'll admit that I haven't asked other people about what would you change. Though it was reassuring to find Kent's blog post <laughs> uh, last month. Yeah. Oh, but it's one of those things, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if uh, people would answer the same thing, but then uh, once you say it and you give, it the, give the, those examples that you did in your uh, talk, uh, you recognize a lot of things. You say, yeah, this happened to me, this happened, both related to development, but also to the per <laughs> personal uh, life. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I've had multiple people over my career say to me things like, one guy in particular I'm thinking of say, People shouldn't do that. They should just leave their emotions at the door when they come to work. And I'm like, okay, that's a lovely theory. 
but it's just not going to happen. <laughs> so, so figure out what to do. <laughs> so I agree it's not possible, but I also wonder, we wouldn't like it without emo. It wouldn't be right. It wouldn't be good. I think there will be far more disadvantages or mishaps without it. And I wanted to, uh, to ask you to enlarge upon one example uh, that you gave in your talk, for instance, and I again recognize it. So uh, if somebody is a developer and then either goes into the new team or a new team receives a legacy project, and then in the early stages, it generates a lot of frustration because uh, you see some things that are not done the right way. You would like to do them better, but you can't immediately. But also you feel frustrated because if you build new features on top of that, you're forced to build them in the same uh, wrong way. Uh, so you did mention that. So then what's your advice for people that are in these situations? So there's a few different pieces that I would put in. Uh, one is it, you should feel free to acknowledge that what you have is not what you would like. Right? The, the code you've got is, is not what you would prefer to have received. But blaming the people who came before you is not useful. Right? But, but it's easy. It's easy to do. <laughs> but it doesn't but help. You discover along the way that it was you three or four months ago. Yeah, that's, that's embarrassing, but common. Yes. <laughs> um, so that's the first thing. It's just like one of the things I say to people a lot is deal with the situation you have, not the situation you wish you had. Okay. So I wish I had better code, but I don't. So let's just forget about that. Let's not rail about how we got here. Let's worry about what we've got right now. Um, so, okay, I've got a less than optimal code base and we need to add these features and I'm going slower than I would like to. Okay, are there limited improvements we could make to the code base that would make it easier to work with for the, for the problem that we have to solve? But what can we do to make our lives easier rather than worrying about how we got there? Right. There are, there are some well-known uh, tensions among various speciali specializations in, uh, in engineering. For instance, uh, developer, tester, developer, designer, developer, ops, wondering if the list could continue. I mean, <laughs> developers, whatever. Uh, in this particular example, would you have any advice for, on how to approach the conversation or? Yep. Uh, a very useful conversation I've had is what are you worried about or what are you scared of or what, what do you think will go wrong? Right? I need to be able to put myself in the other person's shoes and, and see the world from their perspective and then I can start to uh, address their concerns. So that the thing I said from Covey, seek first to understand then to be understood. Okay, so Mr. or Ms. Tester, what are you worried about? What are your concerns? Okay, well, you think if we do this, then this will happen. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay, here are my concerns. Okay, now how do we move forward? Okay, so, so <laughs> yeah, good one. Um, there is, uh, well, still a lot for us to do in the empathy and com compassion space and training our skills and so on. At the same time, we're now training, um, you know, AI models. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> emotions. Is that dangerous? Where does it lead us or potentially lead us? So, okay, this is a, a deep potentially deep conversation, but there are things that most people would acknowledge fairly easily, I think. Uh, all humans are biased. All of our decision-making processes are biased in some way. When we teach machines from our existing processes or from our existing process things, us, when we teach them, we teach them our biases whether we mean to or not. Uh, and the risk is that we create tools that execute those biases far, far faster 
and with far less transparency than what we have right now. And I don't have a solution to that, but I think that that's a future minefield. I think it's more of an uh, axiom because we had a session about uh, biases and AI uh, yesterday. And uh, I think that's the conclusion that we reached is that, yeah, this happens. Uh, it cannot be other way because biases exist in our world. We just need to I don't, evaluate, be conscious of this, and then constantly try to analyze and evaluate what the system is producing. Actually, explainability and more transparency on, on how you got the debt model. Yep. Yeah, the, the Apple credit scoring process recently, I think, was uh, a fairly high profile case about. I think Goldman Sachs used somebody else's tools to make credit decisions for the Apple credit card. And it was a black box and nobody could explain how the decisions were being made. Okay, I've got another one. Yeah. So studies which are, well, suggesting or, yeah, let's, let's say suggesting that one in five CEOs of the world are missing empathy and compassion, not, not to say that they are, I don't know, uh, psychopaths or sociopaths, but yeah. <laughs> but of course they are trained, yeah, or they, 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 they learn that people in their comp company should have empathy and compassion, okay? Uh, what would you advise such a CEO? Or, or put it differently, if I were in that company, but not the CEO, as an employee, Oh, that's easier. Like, yeah. The second question is much easier. Leave, <laughs> right? Just go somewhere else where you can be the person that you are. Um, I, in, in any, look, the world, in some sense, the world is a game, right? We have set up the rules, whether we call it capitalism or we call it socialism or whatever we call it, we've set up a game with rules. And there are, always multiple strategies for winning the game. I think that displaying strong empathy and compassion is a way to win the game. But there are, as you were just saying, there are a whole bunch of CEOs who have demonstrated that there are other ways to win the game as well. Doesn't, that doesn't mean that has to be my strategy. That's right. Okay. Right. We have a few more questions coming in. So one is, um, how to collaborate with a team leader that underestimates your uh, knowledge and focuses more on the tasks to be done than on your needs as a person? Uh, so I got, there's a couple of, let me do a preface to this. <laughs> One of the things I say to people again as a coach is, and this is harsh and exaggerated, so if you take, treat it with a grain of salt, no one cares about your problems. They only care about their problems. So <clears throat> whenever you say to somebody <clears throat> something like, I need you to change your behavior because that will be better for me, you're unlikely to get a good response. You may if you have a good relationship. But if, it's, if you don't have a relationship, then you're not, very, you're not going to get a good response. So there's a couple of ways around that. One is to build your relationship. Co Covey in that book I cited has a great section on emotional bank accounts and how to build up a good emotional bank account with somebody else so that you can make a withdrawal and ask them to do something that they don't want to do. So you know, first, one of the strategies is to build the relationship. The other strategy is to flip the problem and describe to the other person why changing their behavior will be good for them. If you change the way you treat me, then I'll deliver better results for you. you know, I've simplified, but that, that's, those are the two approaches that I would think about. Yeah, so in a way, uh, changing a bit the context or the problem to uh, be in line with what you said the first time. So. Sure. When, when I start working for a new manager, the first thing I should do is understand what the manager's problems are. And if I can solve some of the manager's problems, I create space for them to give me a lot more discretion in solving my own problems. Yeah, and sometimes we even get, a, let's say, sort of a buy-in. Even if I disagree with you, but you help me and I trust you so that even if I disagree with you, try it your way.
All right, Florin? Yeah, there are two related questions. The first one is, what do you think of the importance of emotional intelligence for a leader slash manager? Uh, and the continuation is, what are the main challenges building his safe environment as a leader? Sometimes leaders have other leaders and it's a cascade. Cool. Um, <clears throat> so the first part was, what do I think, is EQ important? But yes, right. I, I think so, absolutely. That's an easy, like, tick, done. Um, if, so if, if I'm a leader who has a, a non-empathetic leader and I'm trying to create an open environment in my team, so um, the first thing you do is, uh, in, in the UK there's a term for it, but I can't remember, charterhouse rules? But anyway, it's like the idea that what, what's said in Vegas, done in Vegas, stays in Vegas. Right? So the first thing you do is make sure that the team understands that the way we're going to behave a certain way in this team, but... I'll say up front, that's not the way the rest of the organization works. So we need to be opaque. Like we need to make sure that what is said and done in this team stays and is in this team. And if, if I can't create that space, then it's going to be very difficult. Yeah. And then I, as a manager, will try to buffer the team from the rest of the organization as much as I possibly can. And I've done, I've successfully done that. Uh, a few times, especially when I was trying to introduce Agile into very large companies. It was much easier. You can't change the whole company at once. You just, it's impossible. So you create a bubble and you change the bubble and you manage the, the interface of the bubble to the rest of the organization. So Steve, I'm personally totally delighted. Thank you for this talk and for this conversation. And we're hoping to, to have you soon at another code camp, even here in Romania. That would be lovely. I'd love to come. I've never been to Romania. I'd, I'd love to come and visit. Once, once the lockdown is over, hopefully soon, uh, well, of course, you are invited. Thank you. Thank you very much.